Okay, so we'll start. I'll just, uh, yeah. So, um, carrying on from last week, um, I just a quick revision, uh, very important 2017-19 classification, key 67 less than 3% uh, is uh, grade one, uh, well differentiated, three to 20% is intermediate grade and more than 20% is grade three. And we also discussed that you can have a grade three uh, tumor, neuroendocrine neoplasm, which has a key 67 of more than 20%, but can be well differentiated and also can be, can be poorly differentiated. And you would then label them as grade three neuroendocrine carcinoma. I have also sent you the current ESMO guidelines, which were published in, uh, in May this year. So I would suggest that you all read it once. And this is where we left off uh, somatostatin analogs. We discussed the evidence with Promid and Clarinet and the other trials. And the conclusions, uh, I think, are that it works in both functioning and non-functioning tumors. And the anti-proliferative effect is better in, in mid-cut. Very briefly, I'll discuss some special scenarios because we see them in the clinic uh, every day. Uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasms, we discussed that there can be different types, uh, uh, glucagonoma, insulinoma, somatostatinoma, VIPoma. And I think I have seen uh, VIPoma, insulinoma quite a number of times, gastronoma, and, uh, but the others I have not seen, but you may see uh, in, in your career. Very important uh, to understand the diagnosis of uh, Whipple's trial, triad for insulinoma, which are related to symptoms of low glucose, low blood glucose, and also uh, you have to look for resolution with the glucose normalization. These slides are available to be shared uh, later on at the end, uh, end, and all of you who have emailed me, I have emailed the slides back. Last week, I also discussed uh, that for pancreatic neuroendocrine, there has been this discussion that maybe the key 67 cutoff should not be 3%, but 6%. And to answer your questions, why uh, that is the case, uh, if you look at these, uh, these uh, curves, the, in this study, they looked at key 67 uh, between 0 to 2%, 3 to 5% are the top two curves uh, on the, on the uh, curve labeled A. And uh, key 67, 6 to 10 percent and 11 to 20 percent. And as you can see, that the, the top two curves are almost on top of each other for recurrence-free survival. So that's why the thinking is that maybe we should have this for pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasms have this as key 67 less than 6 percent. So if you, if you combine uh, less than 6 percent, uh, 0 to 5 percent versus more than uh, 5 percent, you can see that uh, the recurrence-free survival is significantly better. So that is why uh, the thinking is that maybe for pancreas, or to define low grade, one can say not 2%, but 6%. Not 3%, but 6%. Again, we looked at, please uh, mute your, uh, mute, mute your uh, uh, phones. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. So we looked at functional, uh, sorry, I'll just go back. Um, characterizations, uh, sorry, uh, I am not able to, sorry, I'm not able to go back, just one second, let me, uh, yes. So uh, for uh, gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasms, we look at the functional characterization uh, and you, we discussed that in a patient, uh, ideally one would prefer to do both the functional imaging with somatostatin and FDG PET as well. So that would help you in treating the patient. And, and this slide actually uh, clarifies it very nicely that if you have a well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor with a key 67 of more than 20%, the patient may have a somatostatin and FDG positive scan. FDG positivity signifies, FDG glucose a PET positivity signifies very likely a high grade grade three tumor and during treatment, if a patient uh, uh, is going to have PRRT, one may consider adding uh, chemotherapy like capecitabine to it. So alkylating-based chemotherapy for key 67 less than 55%. The evidence is slightly stronger. This is, uh, there are few, very few randomized evidence available, but I'll discuss them today. 
And these are the various treatment options we said we'll discuss today. I just wanted to uh, just have two slides on this. Uh, we'll discuss a lot of evidence with drugs today. And uh, in advanced setting, we talk about overall survival, progression-free survival, time to treatment failure, quality of life. It's very important to understand the magnitude of clinical benefit scale. And if you read up, um, the, it gives different grading as to uh, uh, how uh, useful the drug is to the patient. And I, I think this is one of the most important scales. Yes, uh, FDA approvals, EMEA approvals, part of guidelines is important as well. But it's important for us as clinicians to see how much it is benefiting our patients as well. So most of the trials you will see, the primary endpoint has been taken as progression-free survival, uh, but it does not have quality of life data attached to it. And the reason why we are doing clinical trials with progression-free survival as an endpoint is because it is easier to finish the trials quickly and have the drug approved. So most of these studies are, are, are industry driven. Ideally, I would, for a patient, what is important is living longer, that is overall survival and quality of life, whether the quality of life that they have is good. So these are the two meaningful endpoints for any clinical trial. I think progression-free survival is great if it significantly improves quality of life, but you will see that very few trials have quality of life data attached to it. And also, I think uh, we live in a resource limited setting. So very important whether the approved drug is cheaper than the existing standard of care, which is never the case. Clinical reality, we'll discuss a lot of treatments today. But uh, one thing fits into the other. You will have uh, most of your patients actually requiring most of the treatments we discuss uh, during, their, uh, during their neuroendocrine uh, tumor journey. So one quick slide on response assessment. I think we are all familiar with the CHOI criteria. If you're not familiar with it, you must read it up. It was designed, uh, it was made uh, mainly for response ass assessment in GIST patients uh, to assess response with targeted treatments like imatinib. And if you, you can see from, from this slide that if you assess response by resist, this also applies to you know, assessing response with bevacizumab in colorectal cancer uh, when you're giving neoadjuvant treatment. So you will, if you look at the, uh, uh, if you look at it by resist, you will either call it stable or progression. But if you apply the CHOI criteria, which looks at the density and the necrosis within the tumor, then the patient has actually responded, even though the size of the tumor, as you can see from the bottom uh, uh, slides, has actually gone up. So very important that you read up the CHOI criteria if you haven't, and we should apply that in clinical practice when we are treating patients with targeted treatments. Very briefly, I will discuss local treatment uh, because uh, we live in a country which does not have universal health coverage. So a patient may come to you in a small town or even a big town where you know, discussing in an MDT should be the norm and mandatory but may not be the case. And even if it is the case, uh, it may not, uh, it may not uh, follow through. So very important that uh, as clinicians, we identify patients who are eligible for surgery, who are eligible for liver-directed therapy. So they are triaged to an interventional radiologist or a radiation oncologist or a transplant surgeon. So I know you may be uh, with various disciplines like medical, surgical, radiation, but it's very important for you yourself to know which patient is eligible for what so that you can refer the patient appropriately. Like I said, right at the beginning when we did the first lecture, that the survival of patients if they're treated in centers of excellence is three times better because the patient selection for all of these local regional therapies is better. So even if you're working in a small town in any corner of India, if you're able to identify and send the patient off for say PRRT or radioembolization, I think, or a liver transplantation, I think it's very important. First question is, is it indicated? Is it feasible, technically feasible? So the tumor may be very close to an artery or a vein. And again, a good radiologist should be able to tell whether uh, the liver directed treatment uh, like transanterial chemoembolization or radioembolization is safe. And the other thing very important uh, is which approach you should use. 
So this is just an example of bland embolization with PRRT and uh, uh, for downstaging of, of, of the liver uh, metastasis. Local treatments, you have RFA, and there are different criteria for each of these techniques. I will not go into the detail because that itself is a lecture in itself. But important to identify liver-limited disease and if the patient does not have extrahepatic disease to see which of these the patient may benefit from. So liver lesions are fed by uh, in neuroendocrine neoplasms are fed by arterial flow. Hence, you have these artery-directed uh, transarterial embolization, chemoembolization, with or without beads or radioembolization. The normal liver is mainly vascularized by portal venous flow. So these are the key questions uh, that uh, you would want to know. Do they improve outcome? Can they find with systemic treatment? And I think the key question is tumor dissemination. And I think all of these, I will not go into detail. There are wonderful reviews on this. Uh, radio embolization is better compared to the others for quality of life. The criteria are not so, uh, so clear as it is for hepatocellular carcinoma. Like if you have portal vein thrombosis, the patient should have a tear and not a taste. So best outcomes have been seen with the radio embolizations, very, very uh, similar to transarterial bland embolization compared to chemoembolization. These are the ENETS uh, guidelines. And they ca it can be combined. Uh, the radioembolization can be combined with, uh, with fluoropyrimidine-based treatment, and there is no dissemination. Very briefly, I'll talk about the surgical approach of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, I have sent this paper today uh, within, the, within the group. So please read this paper in detail. This is a very brief summary for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. I will only discuss the metastatic setting because I think if it's non-metastatic, we are very clear the surgeons take over. So if the patient has a key 67 less than 10%, a slow growth. Slow growth means over the one year, you have assessed the patients with scans and the growth has been very slow. And the metastases are limited to the liver. So surgery, if it is possible to uh, do a macroscopic uh, R0 resection, uh, I think it, is, it should be considered in these patients. But if the patient has a grade three tumor, then surgery is a complete no-no. If a patient has an unresectable uh, disease, but the primary is resectable, again, the same criteria, key 67 is less than 10% uh, in patients with a low surgical risk, surgery should again be uh, one of the things that should be considered. Very important if a patient comes to your clinic that you also identify, does the patient fulfill the criteria? Because we are seeing, at least I am seeing, a lot of young patients with neuroendocrine neoplasms in my clinic. Small intestine, we know that if there's a tumor and if it grows, it's going to lead to obstruction. So if the patient is easily operable, should undergo surgery because, um, uh, because obstruction when surgery is, I'd, you'd rather plan the surgery electively than in an emergency. And again, following the principles of surgery, adequate lymphadenectomy, palpating the whole bowel to make sure there are no other neoplasms. Uh, adequate lymphadenectomy, I mean, the, the guidelines recommend uh, that uh, at least a uh, minimum of uh, eight lymph nodes should be removed in, uh, in, 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 this, in this surgery. I think the number of lymph nodes is different for all cancers, and you must know that uh, because as whether you're radiation or medical, you must know this because for gastric, it's 15. For colorectal, it's 12. The reason is because you will decide or you will discuss with the patient the systemic treatment based on a suboptimal nodal yield. And yes, we can get into a discussion about, you know, the pathologist uh, has looked at it or number of slides or the cuts that have been taken. But very important that if you feel that you've done adequate surgery, you go back to your pathologist and discuss that the number of nodal yield should be more. Liver transplant indication, very briefly, one slide. Uh, again, these are very uh, practical uh, indications. Uh, no extra hepatic, less than 60, low, well differentiated, low key 67, the primary should have been removed. And of course, you have to have adequate liver volume and stable disease in response to previous treatment. So keep this in mind always. I put this here. Now, there are a lot of special scenarios like rectal, neuroendocrine, and gallbladder or breast, but appendix is something which uh, 
I think we see very frequently and we end up discussing a lot. And this is uh, uh, something, again, we should be aware of these criteria. There are different uh, ENETs, uh, AJCC, the size uh, criteria, T. The most important thing is on the pathology report, you have to look at the infiltration of meso appendix or serosa. If it is more than three millimeter at the base, then the patient needs a right-sided hemicolectomy, including lymph nodes. But if the location and where the location is of the tumor, whether it is at the tip, middle, or base, if it's at the tip or middle and the patient has had an R0 resection, the treatment is over. But if it is at the base and, you know, if it's R1 or if there are any risk factors, like you know, there's vascular invasion, it's grade two, or more than three millimeter infiltration of the meso appendix, then the patient should go for a completion surgery with a hemicolectomy. Coming on to the uh, oral targeted drugs, these are the main uh, drugs uh, which we'll talk about. Evrolimus and sunitinib, I think these were the two pivotal trials which led to the registration of both of these drugs. And both these uh, papers were published in the same issue of New England Journal of Medicine. And there's a story behind it. Uh, maybe I'll talk about it some other time. So patients with advanced pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors randomized both phase three, double blind, placebo controlled, randomized to Evrolimus plus best supportive care or sunitinib 37.5 milligram uh, orally daily. It was continuous daily dosing, unlike renal cell cancer, where you give three weeks on, one week off. And the, it was double blinded to placebo plus best supportive care. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival in both the studies. Evrolimus was part of the Radiant program, and I've just put this on one slide. Uh, the Radiant 3 was the study, which, which was the registration trial, and uh, it met its primary endpoint with the progression-free survival being 11 months versus 4.6 months in the placebo arm. And as you can see, the hazard ratio is 0.35 for pancreatic versus 0.77 for non-pancreatic. So very, very, again, this is, you know, uh, uh, not head to head. This is just extrapolation. So very likely it works better in uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And we saw earlier on that the somatostatin analogs probably worked better because of hazard ratios uh, uh, in mid-gut tumors. But again, um, statistically, this statement is not correct. So as you can see, both the curves look very similar with the uh, Evrolimus and Sunitinib. And these are progression-free survival. None of the drugs have actually shown a significant uh, uh, overall survival uh, benefit. If you see in this paper with the Evrolimus, uh, the overall survival curves were literally on top of each other. So again, you can say the study was not powered to look at overall survival and the sample size was done for a progression free survival. Came up with, uh, uh, with another paper a few years later where they said that the overall survival is not statistically significant, but clinically meaningful. Now, I don't understand that term and I don't think we should use this because um, it is not statistically right. If you also see in this study, uh, a total of 12 patients in the Evrolimus group, that is 6%, and four in the placebo group died while receiving the drug. Uh, Sunitinib so overall survival, you can slightly better. Uh, again, you know, the, the people would say it's clinically meaningful, but, uh, but uh, the curves are separating, but it is not statistically significant. It's about 29 versus 30 the nine months, 10 months uh, better with sunitinib. Again, one must not forget that these are very toxic drugs. Uh, as I said, Evrolimus may be more effective in pancreas. Very important that before we start these drugs, there is a cost implication to it. Once you start the patient on any of these drugs, the patient on, is on these drugs uh, forever. So, you know, uh, it, you have to continue till progression or significant toxicity. And all of these drugs actually have significant uh, toxicity. Evrolimus is, is very much like chemotherapy. We have learned to manage the, uh, the side effects well. Now that is another story. So you have to look at the comorbidity to see which drug to use first. So I would use sunitinib if a patient has underlying lung disease. Um, and uh, if a patient has, sorry, I would remove the bottom bit actually. 
If a patient has hypertension, I would probably, or bleeding diathesis or cardiovascular disease, or if there is a risk of fistula or perforation, I would uh, tend to use Everolimus. This is another phase three trial. We discussed interferon last time uh, uh, to see whether it, uh, whether it can uh, upregulate the somatostatin receptor. This uh, trial looked at bevacizumab uh, and octreotide versus interferon and octreotide. Neuroendocrine tumor is a very vascular tumor. That's why uh, uh, after renal cell carcinoma, it's the second most vascular tumor. So hence sunitinib, bevacizumab, all the anti-VEGF strategies uh, being tried here. So primary endpoint was progression-free survival. And actually, you can see uh, on this study, central review and investigator review, there was no difference, no statistically uh, significant difference between the two curves. But again, you know, we have to, as oncologists or, or clinic, uh, we have to look at something else to see and look at the data and see if something is, is, is working. So what the, what the authors have done is they have looked at time to treatment failure and have shown that bevacizumab is better. And as you can see, the curves for survival are literally on top of each other. So whether you use interferon with octreotide or bevacizumab with octreotide, I think uh, is equally fine. So pezopinib is, is another drug presented at ASCO last year. Uh, again, another VEGF inhibitor, uh, uh, patients randomized to pizopinib versus placebo and uh, a progression-free survival of 11.6 months versus 8.5, significantly better. So the progression-free survival with all of these drugs is within the range of 11 to 12 months. Coming on to PRRT, I think uh, I find it quite exciting because it is available, uh, it has been available in India for quite some time and we have certain centers of excellence which are delivering it absolutely wonderfully. So you can combine it with chemotherapy and in retrospective single center studies, the median progression free survival has been 40 to 48 uh, months. These are the various isotopes which are used. Indium used to be used earlier than yttrium, uh, which we, we used quite a bit in, in the hospital. And, uh, and, but the standard of care now is lutetium uh, uh, donate. Again, these are a few examples with pancreatic biopoma. As you can see, the, the activity has gone down significantly. Sequence, uh, sequential scans uh, DOTA scans showing that uh, with PRRT, the liver metastasis uh, avidity has gone down significantly. Again, two studies showing a progression-free survival, retrospective single-center trials showing a progression-free survival of almost 30 to 33 months with yttrium-labeled and lutetium-labeled uh, PRRT. It has been used as new adjuvant intent as well. Uh, so coming on to the randomized trial, this study randomized all patients who had progressed on sandostatin or octreotide uh, long-acting uh, uh, LAR and almost 120, 30 patients with mid-gut tumors to four uh, cycles of with lutate versus a double dose of, uh, of octreotide. And octreotide was queued uh, for, uh, in, in both the arms, actually. And as you can see in this, uh, in this study, the, there is an overall survival advantage. And their significantly overall survival was better in, in patients with, uh, on the PRRT arm. And the progression-free survival was significantly better for patients who were on PRRT, with the median, uh, median being 28 months versus 8.5 months. And the overall, survive, uh, the overall response rate with PRRT, and especially for functioning tumor, this is very important, was significantly better, 19% versus 3%. And only 4% patients progressed on the PRRT arm compared to 25% almost on the, on, the, uh, on the LAR arm. At Tata Hospital, I think, um, uh, and I'm sorry, I know we uh, all of you are from all of the or centers around the around the country, uh, and uh, I'm sorry I'm, I keep talking about Tata and and the Marsden, but these are the two places where I've spent uh, most of my uh, oncology career and life. So, but I would love to hear from about experience of other centers uh, as well. And um, so, the lutetium dotate treatment was started in year 2010. 
And uh, uh, this slide has been shared by Dr. Basu and Dr. Sri Khande. Almost 4,000 treatments have been done. And now I think uh, uh, yttrium dota tate is the standard of care uh, 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 now, mainly given as palliation of uh, symptoms and as a new adjuvant intent as well. 26%, uh, I would say a quarter of patients have become resectable when it is given as a new adjuvant uh, treatment. So if you're interested, I can email you the, the review articles that I have co-authored with Dr. Uh, Dr. Sandeep Basu at Tata Hospital. So it is very easily tolerable. You have a, a mild acute side effects, uh, nausea, vomiting early related to the amino acid infusion. It can cause fatigue. Very rarely it may exacerbate symptoms. The chronic side effects which one needs to be, which are dose limiting and which one needs to be careful about, is renal, bone marrow, and, uh, and ovarian and testicular uh, 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 side effects. The risk factors are mainly uh, diabetes, hypertension, previous chemotherapy, and previous uh, PRRT. The somatostatin receptor uh, positivity is a strong predictive marker. And as you can see, the overall response rate and the tumor shrinkage and the symptom control biomarker reduction and the progression-free survival and overall survival, I feel is significantly better with PRRT. And in, uh, in regional cancer centers, uh, uh, the cost is reasonable. And it is a one-off treatment that the patients need to have compared to if you're on targeted treatment, you are on it forever. Coming on to chemotherapy, very little randomized data. Most of the data has been retrospective, uh, heterogeneous population with various key 67, uh, lack of standardized criteria, and most of the studies have been uh, underpowered. So I will not discuss a streptozotocin trial, the NETO one, because streptozotocin is not available in India, and I have used it, and I was part of the NETO one study uh, when I was in Cambridge. And it's a fairly nephrotoxic drug, and it was given with cisplatin, so I think it was, it was more nephrotoxic with it. So these are the various options that we have. You have Folfox and Folfiri as well. So the response rates are fair. So very important to make this point, and this has been highlighted in the, in the paper that I've, that I've just sent you, uh, the, the guidelines, the ESMO guidelines, which have been published uh, just now in, uh, in May this year. There's no role of chemotherapy if key 67 uh, is less than 2%. And again, the cutoff of 55% is something uh, which uh, we have started to use uh, in our clinical uh, practice. So if you look at this paper, I'm happy to email it to you. Uh, this looked at uh, platinum-based chemotherapy in grade three neuroendocrine neoplasms. And if you look at the overall survival in patients with a key 67 less than 55% versus more than 55%, yes, less than 55% is better, which is expected. Uh, but I think it may probably be related to quality uh, of skin line cape cytobine temozolomide as well. About 100 patients in this study went on to receive uh, cape cytobine temozolomide. And what, what is very fascinating, and you can see here, is patients who had a lower key 67 did not respond as well to platinum-based chemotherapy as those who had a key 67 more than 55%. So the PRCR rate was about 42% in patients with a high key 67 compared to 15% those who had a lower key 67. So this is very nicely hypothesis generating, and it has also found its way into the current ASMO, ASMO guidelines. So this is the only randomized trial we have uh, on pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, which randomized progressive grade one or two metastatic uh, patients who'd received prior evrolimus, sunitinib, and uh, they were allowed to have concurrent uh, uh, octreotide. They were randomized to receive temozolomide versus capecitabine temozolomide on a 28-day cycle, primary endpoint of progression-free survival. And as you can see, the progression-free survival was almost 23 months versus 14 months with the combination of capecitabine uh, temozolomide. And the overall survival has not been reached, but the uh, hazard ratio is quite statistically significant. I think the longest PFS that has been reported for pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine. And these were patients, uh, remember, who were heavily pretreated 
previously with uh, with treatment. This is quite fascinating. Again, this can be done on simple immunohistochemistry. About 50% of pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine neoplasms are MGMT deficient. And if you are MGMT deficient, the chances of response are almost 80%. Uh, and I think this is something which can be easily done in clinical practice and uh, is part of the current guidelines as well. And the progression-free survival is almost 20 months compared to 10 months, uh, those who were MGMT proficient. I think this trial will be quite fascinating as first line treatment for high grade uh, neuroendocrine neoplasms where patients are being randomized to captem versus cisplatin versus platinum and uh, etoposide. Uh, they plan to recruit about 80 patients. So I'm not going to dwell too much on immunotherapy because the data has been disappointing uh, and uh, uh, quite a few trials, uh, most of them industry and pharma driven, have not been very exciting. Looking at mismatch repair deficiency, uh, so neuroendocrine tumors uh, uh, are, are in the group, as you can see, after endometrial, gastric, small intestine, colorectal cervix, neuroendocrine tumors are, are quite up there. Uh, and, and, the, and the current uh, uh, guidance is if you have an MSI high tumor, one can consider uh, immunotherapy. Again, we don't have many patients with MSI high but I think I would consider it if, if finances were not an issue and I was left with no other option uh, because immunotherapy is, is, can be quite toxic as well. Um, so various guidelines, we have the ICMR guidelines, which again, you can look at and you have the Spanish guidelines. Just very briefly, uh, the algorithm for the neuroendocrine grade three, like I said, key 67 is very important. So if you have a uh, key 67 less than 60%, it's easy. One can go with capecitabine, temozolomide, or the other treatments that we have discussed. But if it has a neuro, if it's a higher key 67, and you have to look at the presentation, 50 to 60%, if it's a net like presentation or a neck like presentation, which depends on how fast the tumor is growing, what the tumor burden is, whether the burden of the tumor is affecting the function of the liver or the function of the organ if the patient has lung metastasis, then you would want to go for, in a rapidly dividing tumor, you would want to go for first line uh, platinum etoposide. And second line options are there like Folfox, Folfiri. So again, in, this, in these current ESMO guidelines, you have uh, net with carcinoid syndrome. Uh, carcinoid syndrome is flushing with or without diarrhea. And again, when you're taking the history for flushing uh, in a patient with the carcinoid, uh, the flushing is usually above, uh, above the nipple line, is usually on the face. It is dry and it can be precipitated. By dry, I mean with like, let's say if you have a menopausal flushing or hot flush, it's usually associated uh, with sweats or, uh, uh, but here it's usually dry and it's uh, usually on the, uh, on the face and the neck and it's, it can be precipitated by uh, chocolates and, uh, and, uh, and alcohol. So uh, I think it's very important to take this history about flushing and diarrhea in your patients as well. And then based on the uh, SSTR imaging, the guidelines, as you can see, uh, if the patient is uh, SSTR, the, the receptor imaging negative, then one should consider debulking surgery. And one can also consider interferon, possibly to upregulate the return or also symptom control. So I won't go into the exact details. We can discuss it uh, during questions. Um, for JEPNENS, again, divided into small in, um, um, pancreatic and, and, and others as well. So watch and wait, again, is part of the strategy as we discussed. This is something we should think about in, in most of our patients. So sequencing treatment, I think this is the old sequence. Uh, you have somatostatin analogs, Evrolimus, Sinitinib, and you, which one you go for is actually a personal preference and should be driven by patient choice and patient comorbidities. Other treatments in PRRT used to be quite uh, down the line. So I feel uh, in our setting, uh, at least in, in, in a resource limited setting where we do not have universal health coverage, patients, most of our patients fund their own treatments. And if they don't, even if they have insurance, most of them have limited insurance. 
PRRT, I think, in government setups, in, in public setups, is a very good option and should be offered to patients who have a somatostatin receptor positive uh, imaging. Uh, then you also have Evrolimus and Sunitinib and Capecitabine, Temozolomide. Uh, this is, I'm talking for patients uh, with, with a low or intermediate grade um, uh, gastroenteropancreatic uh, neoplasms. Liver-directed treatment or embolization can be used uh, anywhere during this process. But right at the beginning, very important to identify if a patient will need liver-directed therapy or is a candidate for liver transplantation. Working in a multidisciplinary setting, which has the inputs of an interventional radiologist and a liver surgeon is very important uh, to improve the care for our patients and a radiation and surgical medical is definitely there. So again, consider the heterogeneity. It's a dynamic process over time. Uh, you may have a patient who may have liver metastasis, which are uh, somatostatin positive now, but three years down the line or five years down the line, the patient may become FDG avid and may transform into a grade three tumor. So I think very important over time to consider heterogeneity. A low grade, as we said, is key 67, less than 3%, but for pancreatic, maybe less than 6% is a good idea. Uh, identify liver limited patients. PRRT is something which, which should be offered to patients uh, who are symptomatic and have a somatostatin recept SRS imaging, which is positive. Very important that we identify patients who do not need treatment. And if you're an oncologist, uh, I think whichever area, whichever state you're working in, it is important in this day of you know, Zoom and uh, WebEx and all of these things, very important to identify the center of excellence in your region. And by center of excellence, I mean is a, a center which has, a, which has a, a HPB surgeon input, liver transplant maybe, and also uh, input for PRRT uh, and radioembolization or, uh, uh, or a chemo or, or a transarterial embolization facilities uh, available. The immunotherapy remains investigational in this uh, setting. So I think this is all. I, I didn't want to go too long. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, let us discuss them now. Uh, very happy for you to uh, mute yourself. I think these are the main treatment uh, options that are available for our patients. And like I said, most of our patients will end up uh, needing majority of these uh, options uh, in, their, in their cancer journey. So in clinical practice, do you use CAPTEM versus CISITO for grade 3N? So yes, like I said, uh, I, I do use uh, uh, I do use both these regimens. If patients have a key 67 of less than 55%, I tend to veer towards capecitabine temozolomide. And if it's key 67 more than 55%, again, you have to also look at the behavior. If the key 67 is 60%, like I said, but the patient has had a protracted long course, has received previous somatostatin analogs, I may still go with capecitabine temozolomide. But if the key 67 is, let's say, 80%, patient is very symptomatic, I would go with cisplatin, etoposide. I think very important as part of a tumor board, you individualize. And the other thing is, you know, sometimes I myself take uh, opinions from uh, my colleagues all around the world. I, I may email Professor Shell Oberg or Bertram Niederwiedemann or somebody or Dr. Pavel. Because, you know, sometimes two heads are better than one. Sometimes I would just pick up the phone and, you know, speak to one of my colleagues in Tata or I may call Shona or one of my colleagues all, 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 over, uh, all over India or abroad. Because sometimes it's always great to discuss the patient and, uh, and you know, because our, our, what we want to do is, is uh, there's no right or wrong. All the options are available to the patient. It's important to discuss the options with your patient but also individualize the care in a patient. So I recently had a patient, I'll tell you, who had a pancreatic surgery. It was a key 67, 30%. And pre-surgery, it was, I think, 10%. So I emailed Professor Oberg and, uh, and asked him whether we should give him any adjuvant treatment. 
because uh, key 67 is high, patient is young, uh, there is no data on adjuvant treatment. And he suggested that, yes, we should consider in this patient adjuvant uh, platinum-based treatment. So I think uh, sometimes expert advice is also very uh, important. So uh, may I get your PPT? That's fine. Uh, lut difference between lutetium and yttrium. I think it's just, uh, I, I can't go into the details about the differences between each of them. I think the penetration is, is slightly different. One has beta rays and the other one has beta and gamma rays. Uh, that's the main difference. Role of chemotherapy as first line treatment. I think the only place where I would give chemo as first line is if a patient has a neuroendocrine carcinoma grade three and is symptomatic. That is the only place. But for low and intermediate grade, you have so many other options available. So I would not uh, go for that. How does chocolate or cheese precipitate flushing? So I think probably they have certain, uh, certain, uh, I don't know the answer to that actually. So probably they have certain, uh, certain, uh, uh, certain uh, triggers which would, uh, which would make these uh, endocrine cells uh, release the hormones into the system. Uh, and I must look this up. I knew the answer to that, I've forgotten. Do we give somatostatin analog when the patient is on PRRT? Yes. Uh, we tend to continue the somatostatin analog when the patient is on PRRT, which is what the NETA trial as well. They continued four weekly uh, octreotide LAR, uh, 30 milligram intramuscular during the PRRT as well. Then what is the preferred treatment for liver mets? Surgery versus liver directed therapy versus PRRT. So uh, I think... Uh, if the patient, uh, if the surgeon, if the liver surgeon says to you that the patient can have an R0 resection, then I would, uh, surgery would be the preferred choice of treatment if the patient has resectable liver metastasis. Between liver-directed therapy and PRRT, there is no randomized trial, but again, uh, going from the colorectal data, I think uh, it depends on the technical, uh, the technicality as well and the finances as well. Liver-directed therapy, if you look for uh, transarterial embolization or even radioembolization, it's very expensive compared to PRRT, which is, you know, one dose is, uh, I think somebody should do a cost analysis on in India on this because uh, in setups and private setups, in private setups, the cost is exorbitantly high for PRRT as well. But I know about and AIMS. These are the two centers I know, uh, Dr. Basu, Dr. Bal. PRRT is very cost effective. So I think resources are also a big, uh, big differentiator. Even in, uh, even in uh, regional cancer centers like Tata and AIMS, uh, liver direct therapy like radioembolization or, uh, or uh, 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 transarterial embolization is quite uh, expensive. It can go, the cost can go up to a five lakhs as well compared to for PRRT, it may be only 20 to 30,000 rupees. So it's a huge difference. So surgery, first choice. Then um, what to do for completely resected grade three neck uh, and neuroendocrine carcinoma. So I'm assuming the key 67 is more than 20%. So again, no data for uh, radiotherapy if it's completely resected. Uh, and if you look at the guidelines I've just sent you uh, on ESMO uh, guidelines, which came this year, so they also uh, recommend individualizing and considering platinum-based adjuvant chemotherapy in, in certain patients. Like I discussed this patient as well, we, we went with the platinum-based uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. The patient had a, had a, a small uh, pancreatic net, so we went with the uh, Folfox. Um, now, another patient, 55-year-old male, diagnostic, diagnosed as metastatic CA pancreas, HPE component of neuroendocrine carcinoma with focus of poorly differentiated carcinoma. So uh, neuroendocrine is a small component. Key 67 is uh, what should be the drug of choice, cisanitoposide or captain? So I think the main uh, component is neuroendocrine carcinoma with a slight focus. So if it is less than 30% of poorly differentiated uh, adrenocarcinoma, 
I think here uh, my drug of choice would be uh, capecitabine temozolomide because the key 67 is less than 25% and the biology is being driven and the prognosis is being, will probably be driven by the neuroendocrine carcinoma. Then the next patient is a 56 year old male, patient with grade two key 67, 8% pancreatic net with disease to local invasion to spleen, adre to spleen adrenal stomach and tumor thrombus, huge net. Uh, it's going to the spleen and uh, so stomach on the left side, okay. Patient has complaints of left-sided abdominal pain, no hormonal symptoms. Okay, so I think, uh, so there are a few patients that I have seen like this who are very locally advanced, but if you downstage them, because I, I can't see any vessel involvement. It is mainly, so the patient may need what we may say a multivisceral resection. Uh, right now the surgery may, be, may carry a very high morbidity. So the key 67 is less than 10%. I would actually try and downstage the patient. So what I would suggest is do a DOTA scan in this patient and, uh, and consider PRT. Because as you can see, the response rate is the best with the PRRT compared to all the other uh, treatment modalities that we have. One can also consider doing an MGM in this patient and if it is MGMT deficient being a pancreatic net you can give capecitabine temozolomide as well or give uh, capecitabine as a radiotizing agent along with PRRT if the patient has a somatostatin positive uh, uh, positive neuroendocrine neoplasm to downstage the tumor and then uh, then proceed uh, hopefully with surgery so then uh, I think we have covered most uh, 